Dr. Sage here. In this video, we're going to continue discussing the external structures of the bacteria, and we're going to delve into the cell envelope. By the end of this video, you should be able to differentiate between the two main types of bacterial envelope structure, discuss why gram-positive cell walls are stronger than gram-negative cell walls, and name a substance in the envelope structure of some bacteria that can cause severe symptoms in humans. So in bacteria, the cell envelope is composed of two or three basic layers. That would be the cell wall, the cytoplasmic membrane, and in some bacteria, the outer membrane. These together act as a single protective unit for the bacteria cells. So in regards to the cell wall, it helps to determine the shape of the bacteria, and it provides strong structural support to keep the cell from bursting open or collapsing due to osmotic pressure or water pressure due to osmosis. In bacteria, we find peptidoglycan, which is found in the cell walls of most bacteria. It's a unique macromolecule composed of glycan chains cross-linked with short peptide fragments. It provides a strong but flexible support framework. Now, there are two major groups of bacteria. These are called gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. The gram-positive bacteria have a very thick cell wall composed of peptidoglycan and an inner cytoplasmic membrane. So in this figure on the right, in red, we find this very thick peptidoglycan layer, okay? And then inside of that, we have the plasma or cytoplasmic membrane shown in green. The other type of bacteria would be called gram-negative. Now, gram-negative have an inner membrane, just like the gram-positive do, shown here in this light green. They have a peptidoglycan layer, but it's a much thinner peptidoglycan layer. And then outside of that, they have an outer membrane shown in dark green, which you don't find in the gram positive bacteria. So peptidoglycan forms a rigid network. It helps to maintain the shape of the bacteria and it withstands hypotonic environment. The cells are placed in a hypotonic environment. They'll start to be taking in water molecules. What prevents the cell from swelling up and bursting open due to that influx of water is that peptidoglycan layer. A way that we can differentiate gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria is through gram staining. Gram-positive bacteria have a thicker peptidoglycan wall and they'll stain a purple color, whereas gram-negative bacteria contain less peptidoglycan and do not retain the purple color dye. Instead, they retain a counter stain that looks pink. So in figure form, you have the cytoplasmic or plasma membrane and then you have in the gram-positive cells this very thick peptidoglycan layer, 20 to 80 nanometers thick. In contrast, in the gram-negative, that peptidoglycan layer is only one to three nanometers thick. You have the inner membrane or the plasma membrane, and then you have an outer membrane outside of the peptidoglycan layer, which again, that outer membrane is not found in the gram-positive bacteria. So a way we can differentiate them in a laboratory setting is using the gram staining process. So during gram staining, what you do is you add a crystal violet. That's a stain that stains a purple color. So it stains the cells purple. That's the first step. Then you'll add iodine, which makes the dye less soluble. So it adheres to the cell walls. Then the third step, you add alcohol, which washes away that purple stain from the gram negative bacteria but it does not wash away that purple color, the purple dye from the gram-positive bacteria. Now, because these clear gram-negative bacteria can be hard to see underneath a microscope, then you add a counter stain, which will stain the gram-negative bacteria a pink or red color. Now you can visualize that in this figure where you can see the purple gram-positive bacteria and the pink gram-negative bacteria. Now, in addition to gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, we also have non-typical cell walls. So this is a cell that lacks the cell wall structure of gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria. The bulk of the cell wall of the mycobacterium and neocardia is composed of unique lipids. So for example, mycoplasmas, they naturally lack a cell wall. Now, because they don't have a cell wall, that peptoglycan thick layer, what prevents them from taking in too much water and lysine or breaking open? Well, instead, they have sterols embedded in their membrane, which helps them be resistant to lysis. They come in many different shapes, and they range from 0.1 to 0.5 micrometers, 
ranging from filaments to caca shapes or to donut shaped. Here's an example of mycoplasm that can cause pneumonia. And you can see this mycoplasm here is um, using a specialized receptor, which we can talk about things like that in later videos, that helps it to attach the epithelial cells in the trachea of an infected hamster. Now, we briefly mentioned the membrane. Okay, so the cytoplasmic membrane is a five to 10 nanometer flexible sheet molded completely around the cytoplasm. It's a phospholipid bilayer embedded with proteins. So 30 to 40% phospholipids and 60 to 70% proteins. Now remember the mycoplasms in contrast have a high amount of sterols embedded in this membrane to prevent them from lysing open. Whereas the gram negative and gram positive bacteria have the cell walls to serve that function. So the functions of the cytoplasmic membrane are to perform energy reactions, nutrient processing and synthesis, which we'll describe those in detail in later chapters. But as an example, prokaryotes bacteria, they don't have membrane bound organelles. So they can't, for example, have a mitochondria to do aerobic cellular respiration, or they can't have chloroplasts to do photosynthesis. But there are bacteria that can do aerobic cellular respiration, and there are bacteria that can do photosynthesis. So how do they do that without those membrane-bound structures? What can happen is the cytoplasmic or plasma membrane can invaginate or fold in, and then that membrane that's then inside the cell can form complex internal membranes, and it can be used for the same purpose as the membranes inside mitochondria and the membranes inside chloroplasts are used. In other words, to do cell respiration or photosynthesis. Another function of the cytoplasmic membrane is to regulate transport. So these bacteria cells need to be able to get rid of waste, things they don't need anymore, and need to be able to bring in nutrients. How do they do that? Well, by passing through that cytoplasmic or plasma membrane. One example is by channel proteins embedded in the membrane that will allow certain substances, let's say glucose for example, to enter into the cell. The cytoplasmic or plasma membrane exhibits selective permeability. What this means is water and small uncharged molecules can diffuse freely in and out of the cell, but there's special carrier mechanisms for passes of most molecules. So to be able to bring in glucose, how do they do that? Through, for example, a channel protein here. They're also used for secretion, which is discharge of metabolic products into the extracellular environment. Now remember, gram-negative bacteria have an outer membrane that gram-positive bacteria don't have. It contains specialized polysaccharides and proteins. For example, as lipopolysaccharides, which are polysaccharide chains that function as cell markers and receptors. And these lipopolysaccharides can also act as endotoxins which can stimulate fever and shock reactions whenever these type of bacteria infect humans. They also have lipoproteins, which anchor the outer membrane to peptidoglycan. And then they have porin proteins, which completely span the outer membrane, and they only allow relatively small molecules to penetrate. Size can be altered to block the entrance of harmful chemicals, and it can act as a defense against certain antibiotics. The gram-negative outer membrane makes gram-negative bacteria resistant to some antimicrobial chemicals, so they're more difficult to inhibit or kill than gram-positive bacteria. Infections with gram-positive bacteria are treated differently than infections with gram-negative bacteria. Now, the cell envelope of bacteria can interact with human tissues and contribute to disease. For example, proteins in the outer cell wall of gram-positive bacteria can be toxic, lipids in the cell wall of the mycobacterium can be harmful to human cells, and macromolecules in the cell wall are foreign to humans and can stimulate antibody production. In regards to the human diseases the bacteria can cause, two broad categories. Bacteria can have exotoxins or endotoxins. Exotoxins are in a few gram positive and gram negative bacteria. They're small secreted proteins. So the bacteria makes a protein and then releases it to the environment outside the bacteria. In this case, into the human this bacteria is infecting. These proteins are toxic in very minute amounts and they target specific organs. The other type of toxin is endotoxins. You find these only in gram negative bacteria because it's made up of the lipopolysaccharides of the cell wall. So remember gram negative bacteria have this outer membrane that the gram-positive bacteria do not have. Well, that outer membrane itself can be toxic to humans. So for endotoxins, we only are exposed to the toxin whenever the bacteria cell is lysed, broken open, or is dying, and therefore it's broken open. These endotoxins are toxic in high doses, and it's more a systemic effect overall, not targeting specific organs. An example of this would be salmonella. Okay, so this was your brief overview about the cell envelopes 
of bacteria cells. Until next time, this is Ben, Dr. Sage.